Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, September 20th, 2020. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. Do you ever wonder why Derek always opens with beautiful Missouri Ozarks? Well, first of all, they are. But the other thing is that I have found in my 22 plus years of being married to you, honey, that you appreciate a lot of beauty around you. When we lived in Shelbyville, Indiana, we were a a lot of recorded that the stuff was on the top floor of this two and a half story house that overlooked the city. And uh, it was really not uh, nothing spectacular, no beauty Mm -hmm. like we have here. But yet you saw the beauty in it. A lot of um Things that have been created that uh, were beautiful, but the, you know, a lot of the, uh, the 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 yards, they just, I mean, you know, people worked with what they had. There's so a lot of trees, a lot of birds, a uh, lot of there. old turn of the century, turn of the twentieth yes, century yes. homes. Uh, really, uh, you know, wherever you are, this is what I'm saying: that wherever you are, look around because I'm betting that there's something there that you can appreciate and find beauty in, if it's especially if it was created by the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we really have a lot of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, places we lived before have been, generally been in urban or suburban areas and um, didn't see a whole lot of sky. Here we see lots of sky, lots of nature. And in fact, yesterday, you yeah. noticed it. I missed it. And then once uh, you, you really pointed it out, I was able to see it. We had a swarm, a migratory swarm of dragonflies that went past. It was really strange. I was looking off, and again, it's because we could see lots of sky. So you could see these little dots kind of dancing against, well, it's Well, you see starling flocks. Yeah, yeah. Those are obviously birds, and you see how they move. But this was the same thing, only tinier. Right. I thought we had a bunch of hummingbirds coming through at first. Because the hummingbirds are migrating now. But they only but, they go singly. Right. So here we had a bunch of them against the sky. It's like, wait a minute, those are dragonflies. I'd never seen so many dragonflies in my life. But we also at the same time saw a few outliers that were away from the swarm that mm-hmm. were sort of going over our deck and, and seeing what was going on. Yeah. So we learned that dragonflies migrate. I had no idea. N- neither did I. Apparently, that's not something that uh, entomologists... Etymologists. Ent... Entomologist. It's, just, it's like ant. Right, right. With right. an E. Because etymology means the study of words. Yeah. yeah. Uh, entomologists don't really have it's a handle on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tree beard and his, his yeah. fellows. Yeah. The uh, uh, experts don't really know much about the migratory patterns of uh, dragonflies because they can't put radio trackers on them. They're too skinny for those. Uh-huh. And uh, so they've had to depend on citizen scientists. And there are websites out there where you can contribute to um, observations of migratory dragonflies. And apparently it's a really incredible thing. They've got like a multi-generational pattern where uh, the first generation starts in the south, goes north, lays eggs and dies. Second generation uh, in in the fall uh, migrates south again. And then the third generation overwinters in the south. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's really, really an incredibly intricate design. And you just wonder, okay, Lord, why... Wow! Can't wait to ask what what that was all about. Why do the hummingbirds go back and forth from um, northern That's United States down to Mexico because, and South America? Well, as with um, uh, dragonflies, it's a generation born in the north mm-hmm. that travels south. So, what in that little brain says go south? Yeah. Because they've never they been down there. And how do they find it right. if they've never been down there? Especially the hummingbirds that are going all on their own. Because, mm-hmm. yes, they don't they don't fly in, in flocks and swarms. So, right. yeah, it's an incredible thing. And no, and just, they don't piggyback on the backs of geese. That's that's not true. Somebody actually suggested that? Oh, yes. Years <laughs> ago, that was going around the Internet. So if you've seen no, that, no. you've fallen for that. No, no, they don't. They fly on their own. And we've got quite a number that are going through our area right now on mm-hmm. their way down to Mexico. Um, so we've got a few more at our feeders than we had. So they are welcome to it. Also, well, I know that they're happy that we didn't travel anywhere this year because in years past, the last few years, we'd uh, get them all hooked on that sweet, sweet nectar and then take off for Israel for a month. I know. <laughs> Oh, I know the poor things. No, we were here. Um, if you are uh, someone who loves 
uh, birds and and uh, uh, insects and things like that, and you're interested in migration maps, you can go to a site called journeynorth.org. Mm-hmm. I go there a lot, and it's another citizen report website where you can report that you have seen, say, in the in the spring when the hummingbirds are coming back up here, you can say, okay, there's it's late April and I saw one here in Missouri, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. You can learn about the uh, the animal. You can, in fact, on here it's got a map of bald eagle sightings. Hmm, now, that's interesting. I don't know that they're migratory, but uh, there there are sightings on here that. It looks like there are sightings in Oklahoma City, close to Oklahoma City, actually closer to Tulsa. But um, if you love to look at nature with your, you know, binoculars or your, you know, whatever. Or just. And then, I wonder if you could use your telescope to. Um, boy, the field of view is, is so narrow that I think it would be really difficult. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it's tough getting a star in frame. And keeping it in frame, especially because the rotation of the Earth. Yeah, but you would think the closer the item is, the easier it is to keep it in frame. Yeah, I guess it depends on the right lens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've yeah. got several lenses that came right, with right. it. You'll have to give it a try. I used it so, to spy on the cattle in the field behind us, the uh, pasture behind us. Ah, so, and if you're wondering yeah. about the first part of cattle, <laughs> cat, Guillermo del Gato, <laughs> has a brand new home. We're happy mm-hmm. to say that his forever home, F-U-R, forever home, mm-hmm. is uh, now in a little town about 30 minutes from here, and mm-hmm. Derek took him over there. We uh, put him online and you know, so in one of the local uh, resale groups, and, and a lovely, lovely lady. Yeah. Yes. Uh, who had lost a cat previously, would lo- wanted to replace that cat. So Z- she renamed him Zach. So Zach yep. is now living and, and he's close to Table Rock Lake. He's mm-hmm. probably going to be happy as a happy as a little cat can be. Yep. It looks like she is uh, really a, a, a one who, who really loves her animals. Yeah. She's got a couple of dogs. So a couple of chihuahuas who she says love. They to. like cats. Yes. On toast. Um, <laughs> no, but, no. He's he's a little, you know, he's a sweet, sweet, sweet boy. Yeah. And for for her, uh, she's got another cat. She likes to have two so that they've got companionship. Mm-hmm. And so that they're not outnumbered by the chihuahuas, apparently. Yeah. But that. Uh, she needs a third cat. Well, that's it. Um, but that uh, was about as good a situation as we could we could hope. And it was a beautiful drive, too, because it, it basically took me down and along um, Table Rock Lake, which bends and winds and twists and turns, because essentially it's just a uh, dammed up river. Mm-hmm. Um, and Table Rock Lake has more coastline. Yeah, than any other body of water in, yeah. in the country. So this this little town is uh, on Table Rock Lake. And so uh, just a beautiful drive through the Mark Twain Forest, Mark Twain National Forest on the way back. So uh, again, just appreciating what God has created, even in its fallen state, this uh, this world is pretty magnificent. And no wonder scripture says that we cannot imagine Mm. what he has in store for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to get into uh, scripture here. We do. We blathered uh, enough. Yeah. uh, Much more pleasant talking about uh, the beauty of creation rather than politics. We'll just leave that alone. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. So much more. Plenty to come As in the Paul weeks says, ahead. says, think on things that are pure and good and <laughs> yes. wholesome. Uh, and we'll get into some political, well, we're going to get into some politically incorrect uh, subjects here in Exodus 21 anyway. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word. And we just ask your spirit to grant us wisdom and discernment as we study your word, and then to grant us a right spirit as we confront the world around us. The political situation here in the United States, it was already going to be ugly as we lead up to our national election in November, and we know things will be even more contentious now with the news of the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So, Father, we just pray for Mm -hmm. your spirit to help us to be loving to those around us, even those who are unlovely toward us, knowing, Father, that it's not us that they see, but it is you, whether they realize it or not. So, Lord, we pray for the spirit to be gentle in our responses, not compromising on truth, Father, but to, to give the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to let that inform us, but to do so with gentleness and respect, regardless of how they behave. As we know, Father, that even from the cross, you forgave those who put you there because they didn't know what they were doing. And likewise, Father, we see a world around us where so many don't know what they are doing. Grant us the words to speak when the opportunities present, Lord, that we may share the hope that we have in Christ. 
that we would plant the seeds that your spirit bring to fruition. So Lord, as we turn to your word, we just ask you to grant us the wisdom to understand your word to the best of our ability and with the understanding of the prophets. Help us to understand what it meant to Moses and to his, to your people in the day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're in 21. Exodus chapter 21. Before we get into this, by the way, I just want to uh, mention that we are in the weekend of Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So this is the beginning of the civil year. And uh, it's a time that many believe either is exactly when Christ will come and and take his church Mm -hmm. at some future year, um, because the, uh, the, you don't know what day and hour Rosh Hashanah begins. It's the only feast that has two days right, right. instead of one because you're waiting for those two witnesses to declare, yes, that is the first sliver of the new moon. Um, so it, it there and, and plus there are there are a lot of things about Rosh Hashanah that seem to picture a marriage ceremony. Mm-hmm. And so our bridegroom is coming back for us, whether he comes on Rosh Hashanah or not. He is coming soon, yeah. Derek, and I believe. And so he, our, our bridegroom is coming for us. Yeah. And there's some other significant dates that are coming too. Um, Yom Kippur, which mm-hmm. is the Day of Atonement, is uh, coming up uh, next Sunday, in fact, begins the evening of next Sunday, mm-hmm. the 27th, which is a very solemn time uh, for our Jewish brothers and sisters. And then Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, yes. begins Friday, October 2nd in the evening. And that's significant in that um, the Feast of Tabernacles was the time when 70 bulls were slaughtered over the course of seven days, which represented the 70 gods of the nations. Yes. And that gets us back to Exodus because this all began in uh, um, Egypt itself with Mm -hmm. the Lord judging the spirits. Yes. And executing judgment on them. Right. Or part Mm -hmm. of the the judgment, but he was mainly going against fallen spirits. Correct. Uh, Which is the theme of my... uh, presentation for the Ah. upcoming Prophecy Watchers uh, uh, conference, virtual conference. We'll talk about that later. So Exodus chapter 21. So we start getting into some of the law now. Now, these are the rules that you shall set before them. God talking to Moses. When you buy a Hebrew slave. So again, we're already uh, into some politically incorrect stuff here. This is something that skeptics and atheists will point to today. See, the Bible condones slavery. Well, no, the Bible acknowledged that slavery was a uh, part of the culture mm-hmm. of the ancient Near East, of ancient right. Mesopotamia. This was done all the time. You would have someone who simply uh, either had too many kids and therefore one of the kids would be mm-hmm. put into slavery. Or you had uh, some individual, for whatever reason, was without an income. Mm-hmm. And so it was a way to uh, have a life. Yeah. You essentially went to live with somebody else and you worked in return for it. Yeah. it's uh, and, and the word the English word slave doesn't really connect, uh, con- convey the, the no, sense of the Hebrew servant. word. servant. Yeah, servant is, is more appropriate. So, uh, you know, think about the the, the, <laughs> the, the staff at uh, Downton Abbey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is is more like what it was, uh, what it meant. But there are some different rules and, and connotations. And, and by the way, we just point out here that uh, the Bible talking about the existence of slaves, th- this is known from ancient Sumerian texts going back as far as writing exists. So almost 5,000 years ago. We had slaves. So when uh, Senator Tim, Kim Kaine of Virginia declared on the floor of the United States Senate that we Americans invented it, it's like, uh, <laughs> sorry, Senator Kaine. Uh, Take he, a look at your history. Oh, he might have been vice president. Oh. Anyway, Ooh. now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave or servant, he shall serve six years. And in the seventh, he shall go free for go out free for nothing. So. There was a little difference here in the way God was decreeing the uh, the, the institution of servanthood or slavery yes. among this Hebrews. This reminds me a little bit of indentured servitude. Right, right. I, 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 know I had ancestors who were indentured servants. Yeah, so did I. That way. Yeah, I know of one in particular in, in for sure, maybe more, but one for sure. So he shall serve six years and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. So there were not to divide families, which, of course, during slavery here in the United States, that that did happen. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or children or sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. Hmm. Because the master gave gave him the, the wife. Exactly. Right. OK. Um, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, 
and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, A-W-L, and he shall be his slave forever. So it wasn't like, okay, seven years are up, get out. The, the man could choose to stay. But, but let's let's use the word servant because I think the Septuagint is better. It says, and he shall serve him forever. Right. It, he's not going to be a slave, you know. Right, because in English, especially in America, where we've got this... Um, well, it's a different troubled history idea. Yeah. of slavery yeah. here. Uh, yes, we've got a different concept and the word carries a different meaning. So sir, he shall be his servant forever. When a man sells his daughter as a, uh, well, again, the ESV says slave. I'm going to substitute servant for this slave. This says domestic. Well, yeah, servant seems, seems better. Mm -hmm. When a man sells his daughter as a servant, she shall not go out as the male servants do. No, no, stop. In the Septuagint, it says... And if anyone sell his daughter as a domestic, she shall not depart as the maid servants depart. Ah, okay. Now this one says male. Now this says maid servants. Interesting. Hmm. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself. Th this is actually a concubine. Understand this because it says after gotcha. she has gotcha. betrothed herself to him. Okay. Yeah. Designated her in the Hebrew. Um... Yeah. Okay. I wondered about that. So I'm, I'm glad you're looking at that because the, 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 the connotation, the subtext here seems to be, you know, a little more than, you know, just cleaning house. Yeah. So, okay. Again, verse seven, when a man sells his daughter as a domestic, domestic or here. slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do or the maid servants do in the Septuagint. That's entirely different. Yeah. Than it. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, a concubine, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. In other words, by designating her for him, he is not just saying, okay, you're mine to use physically. He's saying, I will protect you and provide for you. Exactly. She's his wife. Yes. Essentially. Mm -hmm. Not the primary wife, but she is to be treated well. Exactly. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not, or I'm sorry, verse nine, if he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. So uh, if he obtains her as a concubine mm -hmm. for his son, right? if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do those, these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. This is extraordinary. This is not how it had been previous, previously done. Right. Men were able to buy whatever concubines they want, use them up, and then kick them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this was really progressive yeah. for the 14th, 15th century BC. Yeah. I'd, so for us to impose 21st century Western feminist values onto, you know, 1400 BC is a mistake. As we are wont to as do. As we are wont to do. Um, we've got to view it from the lens of what was going on in that day and in that place. Yes. And this was really uh, providing protections for women that did not previously exist. Yes, it was extraordinary. Yeah. It's saying that a woman has value to me. Mm -hmm. And men, <laughs> you are not to use them. Mm -hmm. You are to protect and provide for them, which again, kind of sticks in the craw of modern Western feminist values. Mm -hmm. Tough. <laughs> Deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, when you go out and you create your own race of beings. Yeah, when you create. From your, nothing. Yes. When you lay the foundations of your own universe, yeah. you get to set the rules. Yes. But uh, God's rules, God's. God is not. System. A human being. Yeah. He and, is a spirit that is entirely different from us. Right. And yet he loves us enough to die for us. Mm -hmm. I, I sometimes just marvel at that. Often more. Well, especially knowing the end from the beginning. He's like, okay, yeah. Derek is going to do all of these stupid, rebellious <laughs> things. And yet, all right. And yet I'm going to love him. And yeah. Gonna, yeah. Same with Sharon. Verse 12. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if he did not lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint a place, appoint for you a place to which he may flee. This is almost like the difference between first degree murder and second degree or manslaughter. Very much. Now, bear in mind. The recipient of all of these laws. Who's getting these? The Israelites. The very first person to know these laws is M. -O Moses. Moses, yes. Who, who killed a man. Yes. Yeah. This had to have been like, 
Oh, uh, mm-hmm. hmm, I guess I'm pretty lucky. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. he did. He he killed that man intentionally. Right, right. And this is sort of a, a precursor for what uh, later we see as the uh, the cities of refuge when they yes. get into the land of Canaan. Yeah. So uh, pointing a no, place for the you. men to flee. Yeah. Moses did think that he was defending his own people. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, verse 14, but if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. No Wh- refuge there. huh? No. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Oh, yeah, that's oh. pretty clear. Oh, now here's here's a here's a verse that that I think we need to point to when when skeptics start talking about, well, the Bible condones slavery. Um, no, servanthood, not slavery. Different thing. Verse 16, Exodus 21, verse 16. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Yes. That was the basis of slavery in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there were a number of. Uh chains within that uh, supply chain, you might say. Right, including... And some of it was other tribes. Yes, uh, particularly the Ashante tribe of Ghana. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, I was going to politically rabbit trail, but no, I, don't, I won't. No, don't, don't, because it, it, could, it just happened to be that tribe, but yes. it could have been many others, and it could have sure. even been people within the tribe that, you know, this person, I don't like him, right. he's got money, I'm going to take his stuff, so I'll just, you know, give him to the yeah. the white people. Yeah, the slavers are coming back, we'll just... Uh, Ship him off, and uh, we'll be we'll be done with him. Yeah. We'll be rid of him because mankind is sinful. Right, and all men are sinful. All women are sinful. And, and sinful. with this fixation that we have here in the United States on our you know alleged original sin, this is the basis of the 1619 project that the New York Times published. Mm-hmm. Won a Pulitzer Prize for the creator. Yeah, and it was it's called fiction. It is creative. Yeah, actual historians have looked at this and said, mm, no. Well, even the but, writer says, you know, I never said this was actual history. Yeah, I know. She's flipping on her story because yeah. that's exactly what it claimed to be when it was published. But anyway, the... Um, well, then the Cone brothers, <laughs> they start out at least one of their movies saying, this is a true story. Yeah, it was Fargo. Yeah. And, and sadly, a uh, disturbed young lady from Japan went to Minnesota in the middle of winter trying to find that briefcase full of yeah, money. And, and I know, but it was not a true death. story. It, it was, was just there. This is where we're going to set you We're going to tell the yeah. story by telling you this isn't a story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, um, th- yeah, this, this verse here should have been clear enough to every Christian pastor in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries to say, you mm-hmm. know, what we're doing is, is wrong. And there were Admittedly, some Christian pastors who tried to justify race-based slavery. But when you get right down to it, it's really was uh, based on an acceptance of Darwinian evolution. Mm-hmm. And the Christian church has made Which was a absolute, devil's bargain. Yeah, with, it was terrible. Yeah, because Darwin argued that the Caucasian races and specifically European races were, were, were more evolutionarily advanced. Yes, he did. Than the, uh, the black races and thus would eventually replace them because that's how natural selection works. Mm-hmm. And so based on that, there were Christians who rationalized race-based slavery because yes. they're not as they're they're barely human yeah. if they're even human at all yeah exactly it's, it's not it's terrible based, but but, right. but but there was a time when women were considered to be not only second-class citizens right. but maybe they didn't have souls uh, yes and when we see we see right here in exodus 21 that both of those statements are untrue mm-hmm. clearly god placed value on women and 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 set the law for men to protect women that's the thing. Yeah. And again, Exodus twenty one sixteen, stealing a man, kidnapping him, and then selling him to someone else and whoever purchased him, God said, uh-uh, whoever does that should die. By the way, in the Septuagint, in verse 16, it says, whoever shall steal one of the children of Israel. Mm-hmm. It's very specific about who's being stolen. Yeah. Interesting. Because that's not in the the Masoretic text, no, which is again, what the English Standard Version is based on. What's interesting, though, is that um, this too relates to the founding of the the people of Israel, because Joseph was sold mm-hmm. into Egypt. He was, but the law but God cl- allowed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a purpose in it. Yes, yes, to preserve Israel through 
not only the famine that happened, but then to set them apart so they wouldn't be absorbed into the Amorite culture of Canaan. Right. Which, interestingly enough, uh, included in the Code of Hammurabi, who was a contemporary of um, possibly Abraham, but certainly Isaac and Jacob. Uh, there was a similar law, although the death penalty would only apply if the victim, the one who'd been stolen and sold, was the son of a free man. Mm -hmm. So uh, Exodus does not make, the, you know, God didn't make that distinction here. It's like anyone who's stolen and sold, uh, whoever participates in that crime should be put to death. Uh, verse 17 now, whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. Or, or dishonors is the, the other word. Yeah, this says reviles, which mm -hmm. essentially means that. When men quarrel and one strikes another with a stone or with his fist and the man does not die but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoor with his staff, he who struck him shall be clear. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. Well, it says pay for his healing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got to take care of the uh, medical expenses. Mm -hmm. When a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and the slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. Hmm. Here's what it says in the Septuagint. It's very similar. And if a man smite his manservant or his maidservant with a rod, and the party die under his hands, he shall surely be punished. But if the servant continue to live a day or two, let not the master be punished, for he is his money. Hmm. Interesting distinction in the law there. Yeah, I know. Makes you I, wonder, you know, if, okay, maybe the guy didn't intend for the, the servant to, to perish. He was just trying to teach a disobedient servant a lesson. Yeah. And things got out of hand or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's really, again, the Lord is, he's not another human. <laughs> and... The other thing to remember about all of these laws, all these laws are to show we can never live up to them. Yeah. Yeah. This Another is to way. demonstrate why we need a savior. Yeah. Um, speaking of disobedience, you may hear sirens in the background. We've got our windows open because the weather here is beautiful today. So police are out there. It sounds like going down 173 toward Cape Fair. Hey, look, weekend yeah. weather brings mm -hmm. especially glorious, uh, glorious weather like this. we got lots of uh, festivals and, and a lot of motorcycle going rallies going on around here, too. So if you hear the, the rolling thunder go past, as we had yeah, a couple of times right. this morning already, you'll, you'll, that's why. So anyway, uh, verse 22 now, when, a man, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judges determine but if there is harm then you shall pay life for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot burn for burn wound for wound stripe for stripe this is a little different and if two men strive and smite a woman with child and her child be born imperfectly formed mm -hmm. he shall be forced to pay a penalty as the woman's husband may, be, may lay upon him, he shall pay with a valuation. But if it be perfectly formed, he shall give life for life. It seems odd. You would think that the first one would be perfectly formed, and then the idea of burning for burning, wound for wound, would relate to the imperfectly formed. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of strange here, but uh, this is where you get the Old Testament you see in uh, Westerns and, and various, you know, uh, um, films and then books that say, I'm going to get you and I'm taking out your tooth or I'm taking off yeah. your hand because it's hand for hand. Yeah, eye for eye, tooth yeah. for tooth. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Uh, verse 26, when a man strikes the eye of his slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let the slave go free because of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of his slave, male or female, he shall let the slave go free because of his tooth. This is actually really progressive. Yeah. Because I'm sure that there, there were a lot of serv uh, uh, owners who were clearly had tempers and and uh, had a tendency to strike a servant mm -hmm. far more often than he he should. And so you could lose a tooth, you could lose an eye, you could, you know, be killed. Mm -hmm. Unlike a free person who would get uh, retribution, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, the, the the servant was just allowed to go free. But I guess that was considered recompense enough because yeah. the the owner has now lost the the financial benefit of having a servant who was uh, yeah. Bottom for him. line is don't hit him. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Verse 28, when an ox gores a man or woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and its owner has been warned, but has not kept it in and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and its owner also shall be put to death. Whoa. Negligent homicide. Yeah. 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 If a ransom is imposed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. It's like, okay, you get your choice. Death or... Door number three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, a, if it gores a man's son or daughter, he shall be dealt with according to this same rule. If the ox gores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to their master 30 shekels of silver. Uh-huh. 30 pieces of silver. Yes, oh, wow. isn't that interesting? Of course, that's a reference to the price Judas was paid Mm -hmm. to give up Jesus. Yes. Wow. And the ox shall be stoned. When a man opens a pit or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restoration. He shall give money to its owner and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and share its price. And the dead beast also they shall share. Or if it is known that the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past and his owner has not kept it in, he shall repay ox for ox and the dead beast shall be his. Hmm. And now it's 22. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to go to a different tab. Wait a minute. Suddenly I was in numbers. (laughs) That's not right. If a man steals an ox or a sheep... And kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox Uh and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. But in other words, Mm -hmm. his family can't come in and say, hey. It is not murder. Yeah. But if the sun has risen on him, in other words, if it's not nighttime. Mm Mm-hmm. There shall be blood guilt for him. Interesting. Huh. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Hmm. Okay. He, relating back to the thief? Um. But the thief is dead. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. Right. But if the sun has risen on him, there shall be no blood guilt for him. There shall be blood guilt for him. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's what this says. He shall surely pay, he being the person who struck him. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. Theft of what? Life? Okay, if the th- if the homeowner kills the thief in daylight, he can be held liable for the life of the thief. Yeah, that's what I get to. Yeah. I just don't quite get the. And again, this is we're reading from an, we're reading from the English Standard Version. Um, in the original language, there probably were nuances, mm-hmm. and sometimes words that didn't get translated a whole didn't appear a whole lot in the in the texts. So. Later translators look at this and go, oh, I'm not really sure. In context, it looks like it might be this or that. And that may be why in English the the, the sentence isn't making sense to me. He shall be sold for his theft. If okay, they're both so if he's relating been, if he's back been to captured. the... But, but hmm. if the sun has risen on him... There shall be blood guilt for him. Well, if he gets killed in the daylight... That's then, my point. If yeah, he's dead, yeah. then he's not the thief. Who's th- who's thieving? Hmm. We'll just leave this. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, I guess this is the thief implying mm-hmm. that the thief is there to steal livestock. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, and I guess this goes back to verse one because we're seeing uh, ox and sheep being uh, stolen. Um, Whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. Okay, let's look at the New English translation to, uh, because I think they, they take a little more care to 
identify who who the pronouns are referring to. Yeah. Verse two, if the thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guilt for him. If the sun has risen on him, then there is blood guilt for him. A thief must surely make full restitution. So when it says he shall surely pay, they're referring to the thief then. Right. A thief must surely make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he will be sold for his theft. So this is a thief that didn't get killed. Killed, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Septuagint in the Brinton uh, translation says, beginning with verse 3, but if the sun be risen upon him, he is guilty. He shall die instead. Mm -hmm. He shall die instead. And if a thief have nothing, let him be sold in compensation for what he has stolen. Yeah. And if the thing stolen be left and be in his hand alive, whether ox or sheep, he shall restore them to fold. That like makes a little more sense. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, love the Septuagint, and they were using a different manuscript, Mm -hmm. different texts than uh, we have available to us today. Right. Um, but yeah, the New English Translation, they've got a lot of footnotes. If you can get a version of the Net Bible with the notes, the translator's notes help a lot to understand. Uh, we, we like the ESV. It's a good word for word translation. But in this case here where they're using the pronoun he without referring to specifying who they're, it, it points to, that makes it more confusing. Pronouns are really, really tricky. That's why you just say it or they. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that uh, <laughs> professor at the University of Wisconsin who just did admit, okay, I'm really not African-American. I'm actually Italian, but my pronoun is they and them. It's like, wait a minute. That's a plural pronoun. <laughs> That makes no sense whatsoever. You, so you're Italians? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, non-binary, so there you go. But uh, still, that's a plural pronoun. It just yeah, doesn't work. Anyway. Sorry. Well, I guess if we you're saying that digress. you're just a spectrum, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm legion. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's what was coming to my yeah. mind. Yeah, we are many. Uh, if a man causes a field, this is verse 5, if you're wondering. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over... Or lets his beast loose, and it feeds in another man's field, he shall pay restitution from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. Boy, if you've ever had cattle or horses that like to get out, you understand. If fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain in the field or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. Mm -hmm. Californians, Oregon's, they're looking at that and going... Start going to, yeah, you start burning brush, which Mm -hmm. uh, here in Missouri we do from time to time. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think one of our neighbors was burning some stuff yesterday. And usually um, you're, you're, at least in the country here, you're... uh, It's requested that you inform the local fire department so they know why there's burning going on in your property. Right, yeah. Somebody calls and they'll understand. He's got a brush pile he's burning, but... uh Yeah, if it spreads, well, you're liable. Yeah, or a house. There was over here on 173. I drove past one morning and they were setting fire to a house. Hey, it's easier than tearing it down. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And then they just went in and took out all... Yeah, it was weird. Uh, Verse 7, if a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe, in other words, here, Mm -hmm. hold this stash for me, and it is stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. Mm -hmm. Hold this for me. Oh, totally disappeared. Think it was stolen. You, you, you're wearing the same kind of necklace. That's the very necklace. (laughs) (laughs) It's the kind of jade that really holds screams. Mm. If the thief has not found the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. Verse nine, for every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it. The case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. Mm. If a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep safe, and it dies or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by Yahweh shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath, and he shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. Now, as we're reading through these things, 
we who are saved by grace, we're looking at these 600 plus laws that we're going to be reading about in the, in, in these sections and it repeated in Leviticus and some mm-hmm. again in Deuteronomy that we're wondering, okay, no wonder there were so many lawyers, first of all, yeah, who were arguing over whether or not this was broken or that was broken. Um, but we also marvel at the fact that the Lord had to be spo- so specific. Mm-hmm. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are straining on a gnat and you are, what, what was the follow-up to that? Oh, you're straining on a gnat. But essentially, they, they're getting all bogged down. They're choking on the tiniest points of law. Jesus wants all of us to look at the, these laws and realize the intent behind it. God wanted us to be kind to one, an- one another. He wanted us to be honest mm-hmm. with one another. Yeah, this was pointing to the substance. These are uh, that's why in in the uh, the book of Hebrews we read that the the law was shadow pointing to the substance, which is Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, Moses was very specific in a lot of things. And then the scribes and Pharisees kind of allowed those laws to calcify and become they, they really worshiped the law instead of actually worshiping God. They did. The they even had hedge laws, laws right. that they made up to keep from doing the breaking the other laws. Right. That were. Yeah. Laws that were more restrictive so that uh, they wouldn't break the actual commands given to Moses. But uh, as Jesus said, this is Matthew 23, verse 24. You blind guides. You uh, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. That's it. In yeah. other words, yeah, you guys are so focused on these minutiae that you're missing the point. Yeah, which is the heart of the message. Verse 12, but if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn by beasts, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn. Verse 14, if a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. If the owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it was hired, it came for its hiring fee. Mm. Septuagint says injured or dies or stolen. Ah, Now, we're getting into what the subheading says, laws about social justice. (laughs) If a man, verse 16, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed, and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit Hmm. a sorceress to live. Now this, you may be thinking, okay, um, boy, that's really tough. Can you just say, stop being a sorceress? The, the Many of these laws, the the ones about the animals and things like stealing, mm-hmm. those are sort of just almost bookkeeping laws. Right. Because an example in our day would be, be nice to one another. That's the law. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean by that? Okay, it means don't kill each other. Don't... Uh, yeah, give us some examples as yeah, to what this exactly. means. Tell us what not to do. Don't say, be nice. Yeah. We, we don't want to have to think about how the concept... And, and this is why all of those laws were developed. And this, this is one is why reason the shadow that legalism, the this yes, is one yes. reason legalism is so attractive. Yeah, I don't want to have to think about what it means to love my neighbor as myself. I mean, that's the law. I mean, P, Paul writes that out. You know, if you, you, you love your neighbors, you love yourself and love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, soul and mind, you have fulfilled all of the law. That is that's direct, it. Yeah, that's uh, in, I'll have to find the verse. I, th- I believe it's in Romans. But uh, Paul wrote that in a couple places, actually. Mm-hmm. But that means then you have to stop and think about it. OK, how, how does that apply to this situation where this person just cut me off on the freeway? Does that mean I get to flip them off or swear at them or drive really fast and cut them up? No, I guess that no. wouldn't be very loving, would it? Okay. Well, so you have to think about I'll just those do things. what feels good. Yeah, yeah. And that's eventually what always happens. But there were sorceresses. Yes, because the spirit realm is real. Mm -hmm. God didn't say don't do these things because they're fake. Mm -hmm. It's because there are spirits that will answer when you call. Exactly. Verse 19, whoever lies with an animal 
shall be put to death. Interestingly, there are other Near Eastern cultures like the Hittites had rules about that. Well, this was behavior that was uh, part and parcel in some cases of worshiping some of the pagan gods. Mm -hmm. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than Yahweh alone shall be devoted to destruction. Now, why put this in here? If there were no small g gods, Mm -hmm. it's the same as thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why put that in there? And it's the very first one. Yeah. It is very clear that uh, when you read the Bible carefully, it does not deny the existence of other small g gods. In fact, it's very clear that since God calls them gods, that they are real. They do exist. But they have rebelled against his authority. Yes. He created the angelic realm, the spirit realm. Those beings have free will just as you and you and me. Exactly. um, Many of them chose to exercise it unwisely. Mm -hmm. And so God is saying, don't mess with them because you humans are not equipped to deal with them. As Paul wrote, even Satan himself appears as an angel of light. Exactly. And these laws are being given on... Mount Sinai, Mm -hmm. which Derek and I believe may have been in Petra. We cannot prove that. It's very difficult, but... uh, More research needed. Fact is, Mount Sinai, doesn't matter where it was. Yeah. It was the mountain of the moon god. Yeah. He um, was a small G god. Yeah. And in fact, uh, the first encounter we have with it back in Exodus 2, in Hebrew, it's Har Elohim, which could, you know, in English, it's generally translated the mountain of God, but uh, could just as easily mean the mountain of the gods. In other words, it was a, a, an assembly point. It, it was, was the right. infernal assembly. It was a place that was recognized as an abode of the spirit realm. Mm-hmm. Um, Mount Hermon in um, Psalm 68 is, is called the same thing, Har Elohim. So Yahweh is daring to say... In front of all of these small G gods, yes. whoever sacrifices to any small G god other than Yahweh alone shall be. And mind you, it actually says whoever sacrifices to any god other than Yahweh alone shall be devoted to destruction. Mm-hmm. I say small G god because I want to make sure you understand that in the English, it is not a capital G. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And interestingly, a, a small one, this, this phrase devoted to destruction. If you've been following our study for years, you'll, you'll know when we get deeper into the old Testament, especially the book of Joshua, we see this phrase a number of times devoted to destruction. It's the Hebrew word. Cherem. Yeah. Um, it means taboo under the ban, touch it and you die. Um, that is the root word behind the name of Mount Hermon. Yes. By the way, the, the word uh, sacrifice does include sacrificing not just animals. So it's sacrificing something with the intent of, I'm going to kill this to get grant favor from mm-hmm. the, the god, the small g god. Um, so, so it could then even include the, the monthly uh, offering that was made to the spirits of the ancestors. And ancestors is in air quotes because human spirits don't hang around the earth waiting to finish incomplete it could, business. But it could also refer to human sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes these sacrifices were eaten. Mm. You know, Mm. okay, I'm going to eat this for my ancestor or for my God or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Verse 21, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. Now, sojourner, by the way, this verse is often pointed to by those who say, putting a wall across our southern border to protect our borders is immoral because we're supposed to welcome the sojourners Mm -hmm. or wrong or so oppress the sojourner. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, Understood. I agree with that. But that's assuming that the sojourner then is, is coming in and wanting to live peacefully amongst the, the. Exactly. That's what a sojourner is. Right. Uh, Verse 22. Yes. Yes. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will hear surely hear their cry. Now, I don't know what was happening here when because they came from Egypt. So their their practices are based upon the land in which they lived, the, the society around them. So he's trying to retrain them. In Rome, you could have a child and if you didn't like it, you, you had too many kids or you just didn't like the way it mm-hmm. looked, you could leave it out in the, the square. Mm-hmm. For the gods to take care of. And if you wanted to have a child to sacrifice, 
you could take that child from the square and do whatever you wanted to. Mm. Um, sadly, widows and orphans, the fatherless child, mm-hmm. um, today they are mistreated. That's the reason for Whispering Ponies Ranch. Yeah. Because of children who have no families, who are in the system, and some of them, sadly, far too many of them, are treated very badly and abused in various ways. Mm-hmm. You can use your own imagination on that. But consequently, they don't trust human beings. So being able to be around a little pony that isn't huge and so therefore frightening, not much bigger than a dog, mm-hmm. is uh, is a way to get that child open up. So we, we re- really re- relate to this verse. Yeah. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. The fact is, it did go on. If you mistreat them, God says, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn. Mm -hmm. And I will kill with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus later on talks about widows and orphans. You take care of them. Mm -hmm. Verse 25, if you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to them and you shall not exact interest from him. Mm -hmm. We could do with some of that here. Boy, uh, howdy. There is debt slavery going on. There's some people who are paying 35, in some cases, 40% interest when you actually add it up because of the way it is accrued. Yep. (coughs) Excuse me. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, and mind you, they're they're on the road. Hmm. So many of them probably are sleeping in their cloaks, their little wrappings. Mm -hmm. Um, In what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, and I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Ooh, ouch. 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 Oh, ow. Oh, no. Oh. Even a Democrat? <laughs> I don't see any footnote. Uh, There's no asterisk there. Oh, and uh, ow. So, yeah. Uh, mm. Ow. What's really interesting is it's in the same verse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reviling God or cursing a ruler of your people. Ouch. Yeah. The Hebrew term refers to leader of a clan who would have been the, the political class before the rise of the monarchy mm-hmm. under Saul and David. But still, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> ooh, that one hits kind of close to it home. It does. Verse 29, you shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses. Yeah. The firstborn mm-hmm. of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother. On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. Now, this is interesting. Um, Given the status of the firstborn sons in the Amorite culture around Israel. That finch sitting right outside the window. I know. He's just happy as as Larry. Yeah. Boy, these zinnias are great. These are so tasty. These are the best seeds. Yeah, the uh, the firstborn son in Amorite culture was the son who was responsible for care and feeding of the dead ancestors. Yeah, so to the, give the up monthly... your firstborn son to Yahweh. Yeah. What? And to, uh, because Yahweh made it pretty clear that we don't do this sort of thing. We don't sacrifice to anyone else except for Yahweh. That's mm-hmm. the, referring back to that previous verse. So th- this was a big change. This was a big change. Um, We talked about this in uh, Genesis, in Genesis 15, when God made his covenant with Abraham and uh, Abraham was stressed because they didn't have an heir. But their understanding, his understanding of the spirit realm and the afterlife was based on what the uh, Amorite culture around him understood. Well, if they don't do this monthly ritual and pour out the drink offering and give me the bread every month with the teraphim, then I'm going to starve to death mm-hmm. in the afterlife. But so, what does the Lord do for us? His only begotten son, Jesus Christ, is poured out for us. He is. It's the reversal. Right, exactly. So the uh, ritual meal that they were performing, Jesus reversed in mm-hmm. the upper room on the night before he was, be- on the mm-hmm. night he was betrayed. So uh, th- that's really why that is even more significant. We've lost that because we've forgotten what that represented 2,000 years ago. So, yeah, really interesting that the firstborn son was 
consecrated here. This is this is impacting me a little differently than we went through this the first time. Uh, you know, and, and probably if the Lord tarries, we will be impacted all the more when yeah. we read through it again in, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> the way, at the pace we're going. Uh-huh. And finally, verse 31, you shall be consecrated to me. Therefore, you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it mm-hmm. to the dogs. Now, I'm not really sure why that is in there. Yeah, if, uh, well, a sheep gets um, torn apart by a, a lion or a wolf, yeah. Uh, you'd, yeah, rather than saying, well, we can salvage what's l- the left and, you know, turn it into mm-hmm. pork chops or, you know, lamb chops. But no, that's not going to pork chops. <laughs> I don't think they'd have been turning no, it into pork chops. No. Mm, yeah. They no, wouldn't, they wouldn't have had pigs not. in them in the first place. But, um, yeah, interesting. Lamb chops. That, oh, lamb chops, yeah. That they uh, would just uh, declare that it was ritually unclean, and so uh, given to the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so the dogs were framing the lions. <laughs> no, no, sorry, we had our backs turned for just a minute, and the lions took it, so, so we'll, we'll just take this off your hands then, shall we? <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty sure a lion didn't do that. He's over there sleeping tonight. <laughs> In the jungle. Yeah. Um, so how are we doing in time? We, uh, we're we almost at an hour already. Well, so uh, that's how we roll. Chapter 23, we'll have to uh we Made it through two chapters, so that's pretty good for yeah. us, you know. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, it is, because when we went through this the first time, we didn't have as much of uh, an understanding of the context. Not that we're experts on ancient Near Eastern culture, but uh, there are things now that, that, well, like I was saying Mm -hmm. just a minute ago with the, uh, the consecration of the firstborn son, it, it is more relevant now understanding the role that the firstborn son played in Amorite culture regarding the spiritual responsibilities that were imposed on him as the heir of the family household. Yeah. The care and feeding of the the ancestors who had gone on before fell to him. And when he was not performing his duties, then others would have to take it up. Or if there was not an eldest son, there were actually contractors in the ancient world who would hire themselves out to perform these rituals. Totally. I'll really, really do it. Just pay me now. And after your dad, I promise. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and for an extra hundy, we'll do the uh, we'll do the morning as well. <laughs> oh, the gosh, wailing and the gnashing boy. of teeth. You silly boy. So, well, we'll we'll take up with uh, chapter twenty three next week. And what was it you were saying earlier that you were going to talk about after? Uh, oh, it was your presentation. Yeah, I need to need to work that up. Uh, well, not work that up. I need to record it again. Uh, well, I tried using a special a different app last night, and I didn't have something set correctly, and so the uh, the recording didn't come out the way I wanted. Well, but yeah. but um, that allowed me to kind of rethink the order of the way I was presenting things. So now it's better organized than it was. So ah, see, I think the this Lord is, was saying, no, yeah. this isn't the way I wanted. It. Yeah, and besides, you're going on way too long. An hour and forty five minutes. No, no, you can do this quicker. So anyway. Uh, Prophecy Watchers has uh, taken the conference they had scheduled for the last weekend in October in Colorado Springs because the the Marriott there would not host the people who wanted to come to the conference. They said that I think the limit had to be like 100 attendees or something ridiculous. 100 or 200, something like that. But it's like 10 percent of what uh, Prophecy Watchers had hoped to uh, have there. So that's just not going to work. But they've renamed the conference the last Trump conference. It begins on October 1st, and they're actually going to roll out presentations over the course of 40 days. So each day they'll have one or two more presentations that they will release. So mm-hmm. each day there'll be something new from October 1st through, I think it's November 9th, but it's, it's a 40 day period anyway. Yeah, that sounds about right. So, so yeah, this is, this is extraordinary. Also, uh, we want to remind you that an in-person conference is going to take place in Orange County, California. Yeah. Uh, here the Watchmen are putting that together. they will be at the, uh, the, the Hilton Irvine, which mm-hmm. is there at the airport in Orange County. Yeah, the John Wayne Airport. Yeah, it's still called John Wayne for now. I know they want to cancel the Duke, but... Uh, I know. Well, we're going to let him keep the name. Yeah, but uh, November 5th through 8th, we will be part of that uh, gathering. Should be a really interesting time to be in California and praying, because it's right after the election. I know. Well, you know what? It could be a wonderful opportunity. Yes. Amen to that. So we'll assume that the Lord knows what he's doing. Yeah. But uh, Mike Kerr and Jeannie Moore say that uh, the Hilton is working with them. They have promised that they will accommodate everyone if uh, social distancing requires. We'll meet outside, which 
early November in California, Southern California should mm-hmm. be pretty pleasant. So um, we'll be uh, there one way or another. Yeah, and, I know um, Jeannie isn't inclined to put on a mask, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> She's been known to argue over that. Yeah, telling the Park Service guys at, uh, at Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmore I'm yeah, not, I'm not a doing a mask. So anyway, you find out more at hearthewatchman.com. And speaking of, they're igniting the fire virtual conference is next weekend, September 25th through 27th. And you have and, a presentation for that, so you're included. Right. Yep. Yes. And we can save you 20% on that. We've got the code now. So you, if you use Gilbert20, Gilbert20, when you sign up for either one of these, actually, you can get 20% off on the registration. I love that. Yeah. And Igniting the Fire, it's only 39 bucks to start with. Plus, they're giving you access to all the videos from the Dallas conference this year. Get out. So you're getting two for the price of one for under 40 bucks and 20% off with Gilbert 20. Wow. You know, it's so funny that Dallas conference was not that long ago, six months ago, maybe. Yeah. But the presentation that I gave on COVID-19 is so, I mean, it's just the yes. oldest, oldest news. But the interesting thing about it is it'll give you an idea of what was going on back then. Yeah. That was really, uh, other than the the Watchmen or the uh, the Warrior Summit and Retreat a couple of weekends ago, this was the last time that we'd had an in-person conference this year. Yeah. We're so. praying next year will be awesome, filled with lots of in, in-person opportunities. And we want you to join us in Israel if you can. April 2021 is still a go. Mm-hmm. Yep. So go to skywatchinisrael.com for information. Yep. Who's on VFTB tonight? Well, actually, this week I've been so busy, there will not be a VFTB tonight. Um, busy editing Iron Dragons, my novel. Busy oh, working it's up worth it. My, Look, so. Iron Dragons is such a good book. Well, thank oh you. Oh, my gosh. Um, there's a there's a deal coming up through Skywatch that you'll find out more about close to the end of October, early November. Um in fact, we need to record programs for that pretty soon here. Yep. Yeah, boy, the fall is just... Well, the new studio for Skywatch TV is almost complete. In fact, the sound guy was out uh, this week mm-hmm. and uh, the Light guy's camera, coming out this week. lighting and cameraman is uh, coming out this week to help uh, Joe Horn set things up. So once that's done, we should be... In fact, I think our programs will be the first ones recorded in the new studio. That's exciting, isn't it? It, it truly is. It truly is. Uh, right now, Skywatch TV has kicked off the first of four weeks about the new documentary film Silent Cry by Josh Peck. Speaking of widows and orphans yeah. and, and getting into the idea of trafficking, Josh Peck's documentary is extraordinary yeah. and so timely. He has found his calling. Yeah. Because this documentary is... is it is big studio quality, network television quality, and it is a very important topic, of course. And he dives into some subjects that uh, you just don't see in the major media. It opens up with information released from FBI files about a, a shadowy group called the Finders. Yes, I do remember that very well. You and I talked about the Finders on PID Radio. Years ago on PID Radio, right. So the Finders who were... Well, uh, too, too long for us to go into at this point, but uh, too long. just you can go to PID radio if you want to listen to some of the old shows. Right, right. The, but the disturbing aspect of that was that uh, despite clear evidence of child trafficking and sex abuse of minors, a government agency stepped in and shut down the investigation by the FBI and the Metropolitan Police in Washington, D.C. and said, uh, that's it. Your, your investigation is done. And uh, so very disturbing. But that's what starts the uh, the documentary. Uh, you'll find that program at uh, skywatchtv.com uh, or any of the other places you can find Skywatch TV online. By, by the way, if you go to skywatchtvstore.com, you can find the Silent Cry Help the Children package that includes the DVD. It also has a whole bunch of other stuff with it. So if I remember correctly, and you can cut this out if you want to, if I'm wrong... But I think the all of the proceeds from the Silent Cry offer go to Whispering Ponies Ranch. Well, um, I think you're right. I think you're right. It's it's certainly uh, with anything we do at Skywatch TV. Uh, certainly, the anything above cost. Yeah, but I think in the ad, Joe actually says that. Okay. Now again, you can cut that out if I'm wrong. I'll have to go back. But and if look I'm right, that. I win. <laughs> <laughs> I win points. <laughs> But uh, definitely worth it. You can also, um, if you're outside the United States and shipping costs for DVDs is high because we get email frequently from Australia, the UK, Europe, New Zealand, uh, asking 
how do we get it here? Because, mm-hmm. you know, shipping a $20 DVD from the United States costs like 90 pounds Australian or plus $90 VAT. Australian. Plus, yeah, plus VAT. Uh, Silent Cry is available for streaming from Amazon Prime. So you can get it at Amazon that way uh, and not have to go through uh, and not have to get a physical copy. Yeah. So and there is a way to get it to you without having to pay to ship a product from the United States. Is it going to be available on Vimeo for, for a fee? I don't know. Because I know that we put some of our other things on Vimeo because not everybody may have Prime. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, possibly, but that, I, I don't know that yeah. for a fact. So, well, anyway, so there out. you go. Check well, it out. One and, other, uh, one other bit of news. Um, you, you know, of course, that uh, the Gilbert House Fellowship is available on all sorts of podcast platforms, including Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and now Amazon Podcast has whoa. added the Gilbert House Fellowship, so you can get us through Amazon. Go as well. Amazon. So, I'm going to add that link to the uh, left hand column at GilbertHouse.org. They looked at it and said, you know, those two people, they're always buying stuff from us. So. <laughs> <laughs> Least we can do. Yeah. Uh, now the Lord worked yeah. it out. Father, thank you for bringing us together over your word. And Lord, we are so grateful for the understanding with which you've blessed us. We know, Lord, that we are still babes when it comes to really understanding your will. But Father, we pray for your spirit to grant us wisdom, help us to grow in wisdom and knowledge and in love to those around us. Help us to be a light in, in a darkening world. Father, we pray for your blessing on those who are preaching the gospel, especially those who are preaching in, in places where your gospel is, is forbidden, in China, in Iran, in the Middle East. Uh, Father, we pray for your protection over those missionaries who are working in those foreign fields. And we pray, Father, for your soon return. Uh, Lord, may we have the strength and the courage to be about your business of making disciples until you return and call us home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. 